Welcome to Vikefans.com's exclusive series, Jay's All Out Blitz. A look inside the key challenges and issues facing NFL players and the Minnesota Vikings in 2013. And now your host, Tom Moore, and former NFL linebacker, Jay Foreman. Welcome everyone to Vikefans.com and our October 17th edition of Jay Foreman's All Out Blitz Series. I'm Tom Moore, and I'm joined by former NFL linebacker Jay Foreman. And Jay, someone needs to stop the quarterback merry-go-round so we can get off for a while, as yesterday Leslie Frazier announced that Josh Freeman, who was acquired just over a week ago by the Vikings, will start Monday night against the New York Giants. This is the third quarterback change for Minnesota this season. How does that affect the psyche of a team? Everybody's in, in, I guess, in a holding pattern. Everybody's in a gray area. Even though you're a defensive player, it doesn't affect you personally or directly, but it does because it's indirect because how the offense performs, how confident the offense is, you're going to gain more confidence, and obviously it's a team game. So a lot of people are in a wait-and-see type of mindset, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens considering going into the season, and even if you look back into the off season, even though they signed Matt Castle, there was – the clear statement, Ponder is our guy. Ponder gets hurt, Castle plays pretty good, again comes in and does well in a backup role. People are looking for him to take the starting position. He doesn't play so well. The Vikings are lucky enough to trade for Josh Freeman, a Pro Bowl player at one point in time. They know eventually he can probably get back to where he needs to be to be an effective player. Now he's starting in a matter of two weeks. So it's interesting over there at the, the Vikings headquarters, but it's going to come to a head this weekend. And the Vikings are really looking – to see if he can be something that they can trust and be the franchise quarterback long-term. They know he has the tools to be a franchise quarterback, but this is his tryout for the next three or four games and probably the rest of the season. Well, you mentioned Matt Castle, and he's gone now from the number two quarterback to number one, and now he's number three. And he did struggle at times against Carolina, but still has proven more effective statistically than Christian Ponder. Do you think his demotion to the bottom of the depth chart is likely more disappointing or devastating to Castle? I think he's been around the block enough, oddly enough, that situation the last couple of years in Kansas City, I think, is probably hardened his psyche to the point that he's nothing can really affect him mentally. He knows, and every player knows, and especially on the offensive side of the ball, who played better between Ponder and Castle. So being the number two and number three, that really doesn't matter because, you know, you're not starting. You're only going to get in unless Scott Freeman is playing really, really bad or happens to get injured. So I don't think it's really devastating to him. It's probably more disappointing in the sense that he probably feels that he's played good enough to be the backup quarterback so the first guy off the bench. But then also he knows that the Vikings probably are having on there in that position right now because of the first-round status that he's drafted. In. With Josh Freeman, what do you think he brings to the quarterback position that either Ponder and Castle don't? And do you think he could possibly be ready to play effectively after just one week of absorbing the system? Well, he brings a lot to the table. He brings everything that you want in a franchise quarterback. He has size. He can run a little bit. He's not a Michael Vick, but he can affect you running the ball as well uh, when, the, when the pocket breaks down make every throw in the book. He's been there and done that. He's taken a team that wasn't very talented, campus to the playoffs. So he has all the, the tools that you want. Now they want to see the intangibles. As far as him being effective, I think, you know, to be honest with you, no way that he knows the playbook good enough to be at his peak. But what they're looking for is how does he handle this adverse situation? How does he prepare? Is he making excuses? Is he looking for a way out? It's not just what he does on the field. It's what he does off the field. He listened to Leslie Frazier when he was announcing that he would be starting. The first thing or one of the first things he talked about is work ethic. So that's something that was coming out of Tampa was a negative as far as Josh Freeman is, is concerned. So these are the things that they're looking for moving forward from him. And maybe that will produce on the field as well. When teams start to lose like the Vikings have, and I know you also follow teams like the Texans and the Giants, they're losing as well, things get to be a little testy with the fans in the front office. And some fans believe that a rift may be developing between general manager Rick Spielman and head coach Leslie Frazier over personnel moves and the on-field performance. And we have no idea if that's true. But you've seen head coaches lose their jobs during your playing career. What are the signs you typically see between coach and GM when things are nearing an end? Well, the the GM... Generally, and this is a high percentage, you know, 99% of the time, isn't around a lot. They might come around on a Friday practice where it's kind of, you know, the haze in the bar type of practice. But some of the type of things that you might see 
are more interviews by the GM, vagueness in his statements as far as the head coach and his, his ability to stay around long term. Uh, and then also, I, I wouldn't call them odd, but out of the norm personnel moves where well, he's maybe signing guys that maybe haven't played well, but he wants them around long term because he already has his eye on a coach or two for the next season or the next uh, I'm just doing it after that. So, it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting. That the always equate the, the GM and the head coach uh, relationship like a marriage. You know, every day it's something. It, they're never going to really agree on everything, but they need to agree on the main thing. So if they're breaking down on the main things, then I'll do one of them is who is going to be their franchise the starting quarterback and when he's going to start. That's a big rift, and that's sometimes something that you can never get over because the GM is ultimately the controller of the personnel. He does have the authority a lot of times to tell the head coach who to put in. And so if that's the case, then, of course, there's going to be some animosity from head coach towards the GM. But they're both professionals. Both been around the, the, the game a long time. Leslie, obviously, as a player and obviously as a coach, and the, uh, Mr. Spillman as an administrator, GM, and all that. So they should be fine. They'll be professionals, and I'll see everybody just wants to win the game, and that's what has been a problem for the Vikings this year so far. And from your experience of being around, you've seen coaches be let go before, and whether that's a head coach or a coordinator, who typically makes that call or that push? Is it really the GM, or how much does the owner get involved? Again, that depends on the owner. I can tell you, uh, I guess my welcome to the business side of the NFL where John Butler was a well-renowned, well-respected GM that, that was at the Buffalo Bills. He had hired Wade Phillips. Uh, we were struggling that year. We, it was the year after the Music Seed of Miracle. Uh, looked, uh, Wade had made a statement that we weren't going to make the playoff, even though we were mathematically filled into making the playoff. And if we would have won the last three games, we would have made the playoff. And then Ralph Wilson was so upset, who was the owner of the Buffalo Bills, and a great owner and an innovator in the NFL, uh, bringing the today's modern NFL to, to life, wanted him fired. John Butler didn't want to fire him. So John Butler, in turn, got fired. Then he also went on to become the GM at San Diego Chargers. But, and then also I've been around with coaches, not only head coaches, but assistant coaches get let go during the season. So sometimes it can come all the way down from the owner, but most of the time it comes from the GM. Or if the head coach and assistant coach have a philosophical difference or I guess the personal difference, then one of them will get let go immediately turn two. On the offensive side of the ball against Carolina, Adrian Peterson elected to play in the game despite the tragic death of his infant son on Thursday the week before. Uh, have you been on a team that experienced such a tragedy? And if so, how do players typically react to this kind of a situation? I've never been around a situation like that. I was being a father that hit home. It's a unique situation with Adrian and, and his son in the past. I know he was just knowing Adrian a little bit. He was excited to meet the young man. You know, the first time that he gets to be and lay eyes on him, on the brain field, pass away. Uh, I think a lot of times the football field and your teammates is the safe haven for players in times of distress and stressful situations. So I didn't really personally have a problem with Adrian playing. Uh, Brett Favre played after his dad passed. Or Smith played after his brother was unfortunately in a car accident. So this is where football players go to feel safe, feel secure, even though you have a great support system around you and a family. This is what you do. This is where you can release all that stress, all that anger, all that feeling deep inside of what happened to that young boy out in your profession. And then after the game's over, you have to go and grieve, and that's what Adrian's done. So I've never been personally in that situation or on a team in that situation, but the only thing is close enough probably if I had to compare it was uh, 9-11, and that was, uh, you know, the whole league was uh, grieving about that unfortunate accident in New York City. So it wasn't something that was just personally with our team or somebody that I knew that uh, tragic situation happened to. Last week, uh, the Vikings had some good news. They extended the contract of Brian Robinson for four more years. And, Jay, you've been in the NFL contract uh, negotiations before. Typically, how long does the process take? And do players get actively involved, or do they just leave it to their agents to handle? Uh, it can take a while when you're talking about a big contract. Typically, it can last maybe a month or two. Usually, the team approaches uh, a player, especially during the season, uh, like in Brian's case, about extending it out or restructuring the contract for the betterment of the player and the team. Uh, so, usually, it can take you know two to four weeks, maybe eight weeks at the most. And then, depending on the player, I don't really think they're involved that much because their job is to play. 
that the agent's job is to go out there and get them as much money as they can. And that's usually what happens. Now, you see some players that maybe represent themselves or have a different relationship with the owner and GM. That's when you see more involvement. This situation, I imagine that Brian's agent did the bulk of the negotiating, bulk of the numbers. It just ran them by Brian. Brian probably talked it over with his family, and now he agreed to the contract. But you give us a unique glimpse into what it's like for a player here and having an agent. What is the typical percentage that an agent takes from the contract when his work is done? I think the standard is uh, 3%. Uh, sometimes when you have the guys that are picked in the first round and very high, the agent will take a reduced agent fee, maybe not the percent or percent and a half. But just because the signing bonuses used to be so high, 3% was looked down upon to represent a number one overall draft choice. They probably work, you know, sometimes maybe a total of eight hours. But it's a hard job in the sense that you have to get the players. You have to make sure that they are obviously healthy enough, but then obviously stay mentally engaged in order to not to play well, in order to get back to the negotiating table to your rookie contract. They do a lot of work, obviously, beforehand to acquire the player, to get the contract done is obviously maybe a shorter situation for them. But when that's done, what else does an agent do throughout your career? Uh, not too much, and that also depends on the agent. In my personal feeling, I've had both. I've had good agents, I've had bad agents, I've had the middle of the road agents. And I think that what really separates the good agent from just the average agent, and there's a lot of guys that agents out there that have a lot of clients but aren't very good agents, is that what you do for the player outside of football. Not just the endorsement, because usually the endorsement will come to the agent, and they'll be find themselves find out who the agent and contact them. Do you help them? with finding them a good, reputable, trustworthy financial advisor. Do you help them get opportunities outside of just your appearances, but second career opportunities in the field that they want to go in? That would really separate a good agent from a not-so-good agent. But then also an example of a good agent is if his players still talk to him after they retire. And the reason why I say that is because both agents lose your number, or don't communicate with you after they know they can't get the three percent from you, or if they have to work too hard to get the three percent for you to get out to get on a good team in a good situation. When we turn back to the Vikings, there's a whole bunch of problems to look at this year, but one that's been pretty consistent is the Viking offensive line has really been porous and specifically in pass blocking. Why are they having so much trouble in the pass blocking side of the game? First and foremost, they're not running the ball at the same clip as they were last year. So, therefore, when you're not running the ball as effectively as they were, and Adrian Peters is after a great year, but he's not putting up out to the same numbers as he had last year, is because that gives teams more opportunities to rush the passer. And then, obviously, more opportunities are going to lead to, obviously, more sacks. And they just have not protected well. They didn't have to protect well last year because they were running the ball against eight, nine, sometimes ten-man front so well that they didn't have to pass the ball. So, obviously, their attempts per game were way down last year versus this year. Individually, some guys haven't played well, and then collectively, they just have not been a cohesive unit, even back to the preseason, now into the season. So they're going to have to work extra hard to get that cohesiveness back, but then also work on their individual craft to become a better collective unit. When you drop back to the defensive side, the linebackers haven't been a strength this year on the squad, and that's unlikely to improve with Desmond Bishop undergoing season-ending ACL surgery. But what I wanted to ask you about is Aaron Henderson, and he was quoted uh, yesterday on KFAN Radio in the Twin Cities as saying he's consistently graded out as an 88 or an 89 all year. Can you tell the people how a player grading system works, and is a high 80s grading good? Yeah, and the high 80s is pretty good. But to be honest, that's probably about standard. And Aaron has played, he's one of the type of players that's probably going to take the front of the blame, but he probably plays a lot better than he's ever going to get credit for. And that's just something that he's just going to have to be, become accustomed to. And he's going to have to use that as motivation every single day when he goes out in practice and out to play the game. Different coaches and different teams grade it a different way. I've been on teams where they just graded you on your factor ratio. So that what that means is however many plays that you're a factor in, they just divide it by the number of plays that you play in. So if you want to be a factor in the play, whether it's a tackle, tackle the law, hit ball, affecting a, a run play, affecting a pass play, but usually one out of three, three and a half plays, that's what you're playing at a really high level. Uh, 88% is what he's talking about, is the number of plays that he plays 
and then the number of plays that he performed his job well. And that's a pretty good clip that he's playing in. But then there's also the other thing that coaches don't really look at, your percentages or your factor rating. They just want you to go out there and make plays. So then what they'll do is they'll deal with the guy that can do great out at a 70%, but if he's a big factor where you get back, turnover, tackle for loss, they'll, they'll take that versus somebody that's playing very consistent. As we start to turn to a couple of questions for the NFL in general, there's been a question I've been meaning to ask you for a few weeks that came from Purple Member, and what he keeps hearing is players leaving the NFL game, and they talk about filing their retirement papers, and what he wants to know is, is there really a process where players file any official paperwork when they conclude their NFL careers? Yeah, it's a very simple process. I think you uh, you know you can write a hand letter, you can have a lawyer, and then you get a pretty much a standard PDF version from the NFL and get it notarized and say that I'm retired from the NFL since the last team that you played with. And then that's it. You're done. You're a former player in a matter of, I guess, however long it takes a fax or email to go through. So it's an easy process. Uh, some guys tend to hold on to, I guess, the retirement factor. A lot of it is a little bit longer than, than others. And some guys make their retirement a bigger deal than others. And it depends on how you came in the league and how you want to go out of the league. This week, there was some big news uh, in Indianapolis as Colts owner Jimmy Ursay amped up the heat for the game this weekend against the Broncos when he seemed to take a shot at Peyton Manning, indicating he's happy that he's not in Indianapolis anymore because Ursay wants to win Super Bowls more than he wants to compile stats. Now, I went to SMU with Jimmy, so his comments don't surprise me. But why would he make a statement like this, and will his words backfire on him by motivating Manning? Well, first and foremost, I was very surprised by the comments. Regardless of how he's tried to backtrack in the last couple of days, he knew what he was saying. I think that he's a lot smarter than people give him credit for. He's a savvy businessman. Obviously, he's a very smart owner, very energetic guy, not afraid to say things that are on his mind. Uh, in my opinion, what I think he's doing, I think he's trying to take all the pressure off of the Indianapolis Colts and put it on him so they can go out there and have the best chance of upsetting the different Broncos. And why I say that is this is, is because, look, this is Andrew Luck's second year. They're pretty much called quarterback god of the last 10 to 15 years back to his old stopping ground. And there will be a tremendous amount of hands on Andrew Luck to not only play well, but play as good as Peyton will probably play against in Indianapolis. So what the owner did, he decided to come out and make a couple of statements that were somewhat controversial put the pressure on him because look, all we're talking about is the owner. We're not talking about Andrew Buck versus Peyton Manning and comparing their seasons. We're talking about the owner that goes into the game. They can just focus on the, the game plan and hopefully the Indianapolis Colts, what he's thinking, will go out there and beat the Denver Broncos. Will it backfire on him? I envision that, that it might because uh, Peyton Manning is obviously a driven, focused player, always motivated. I think when somebody doubts what he's his legacy of what he's done. I know that instead of him studying tape for, just say, six hours after practice, he's probably studying the, the tape eight hours. I think he is, this is a game maybe that he's been looking forward to ever since he was released by the Colts. Now, because let's face it, he's done a lot more for the Colts than they've done for him. He's pretty much built that stadium. He's uh, sold out that stadium. He's brought up a Super Bowl. He's made them uh, a relevant team for 10 years of 12 wins or more. And then I'll see once he gets hurt, they decided to release him and move on just that quick in a matter of a season. So therefore, I know that he was motivated not only to come back, come back to play well, go to the Pro Bowl. Now he's playing at a record-breaking clip. And then also he gets to go back and play against the Colts, where the owner is in a roundabout way doubting his skills on a, on the second-year player. Uh, I'd envision him maybe going 30 for 30 for about 400 yards. I think he's doing pretty good. Well, I think any team would take that. We certainly would in Minnesota this weekend. And I want to close out with a final question this week, also about one of the Mannings, and it's in New York. And so far the Giants have had a miserable season uh, at 0-6. But are you surprised that head coach Tom Coughlin is having to answer questions about the possibility of benching two-time Super Bowl MVP Eli Manning? Yeah, that's very surprising, considering that what those two have been able to do over the years. And everybody knows Eli's an aggressive player. Even though he has an astronomical amount of interceptions, they're not all his fault. For the media or people to be calling for Eli to be sitting on the bench when he is your franchise quarterback, if you always, everybody remembers how he came to New York, where he didn't want to go to San Diego, is asinine. 
because as bad as he's playing turnover wise, he's playing still good football. It's good enough football to win. The defense is not playing nearly as good as they should be. Uh, the offensive line in front of Eli is maybe one of the worst in the NFL uh, at protecting the, the passer, but then also they can't run the ball. So it's an ongoing situation. If I had to bet anything, I could, I would bet that he, Eli Manning is not going to get benched ever as a New York Giant, and so I wouldn't worry about it this year. But I, I am very surprised that they're asking the head coach, Tom Kaufman, to bench Eli Manning, two, two-time Super Bowl champion, and I'll be your best option to win and have a respectful season. Well, as Viking fans, we're hopeful that the Giants and Eli Manning's problems continue at least for one more week. And with that, uh, that brings a close to this edition of Jay Foreman's All Out Blitz. And next week, Jay will return to talk about his reactions to the game against the Giants, give us his thoughts on the bitter border battle at home versus the hated Packers, and tell us what he sees around the rest of the NFL. So until then, I'm Tom Moore. And I'm Jay Foreman. See you soon.